to Dialysis SS Synergy 2020. I'm the master of the ceremony, Emma Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome you here and show you great appreciation for the participation on the meeting while facing severe coronavirus. And thanks to coronavirus giving such a great chance to try a teleconference with which we haven't tried before. And today is the last day of Daisy, so please do not hesitate, take your chance and wave your hand as hard as you can. You are always welcome to ask a question and join the discussion. So, for our first session, talking about innovation, innovation in vascular assets, now I would like to introduce you our chair, Dr. Ke Boren, Dr. Ke from Taiwan, and our commentators, Dr. Su Shanghao from Taiwan, Dr. Wan Heng from China, Nurse Lilian Lo from Singapore, Dr. Zhu Zhongyu from Taiwan, and Dr. Liu Yangdong from China. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my dearest online audience. Today is our third day of DAISY 2020. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is quite an interesting session, I believe. And I see our panel is already online. On the right-hand side of me is uh, Dr. Zhong Yu Su, uh, uh, Zhu Song Yu. Uh, and we have our distinguished panel as well online, uh, like Jackie Ho, uh, Dr. Tay from Singapore, from China, Liu Yangdong, and from China also one hand. And, and so on. So now, and our distinguished speakers, uh, innovation is always very, very important uh, during our daily practice. Without those technology, we can't treat our patient. In the, a long, long time ago, whenever people get a renal failure, nothing we can do. And then we got renal transplantation. Now we got uh, many other good uh, renal replacement therapies such as chemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. But, however, during the treatment, a lot of bad things happen. So it's our duty to decrease the complications and the sufferings of our patient during the treatment and give them quality of life. So in the following section, we are going to hear some talks about innovations in dialysis access therapy. For our first speakers, let's welcome Dr. Feng Yu Wei from Taiwan talking about portable device for your HDSS monitoring. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our novel portable device for hemodialysis vascular access monitoring. My name is Yu Wei from, come from the project department in Xinguang Hospital in Taiwan. Hemodialysis vascular access monitoring is an important issue. However, it is widely easily ignored in every hemodialysis center because uh, doing these things is time consuming and less profit. In Taiwan, we don't create extra charge for patients to provide a service. Besides, it is unable to self-detect as a thermometer. During the hemodialysis room, it can be a um, widely used uh, maneuver to measure in uh, our hemodialysis section for our dialysis patient. Here is our study uh, published in 2017 in BNJ Open. We try to identify the importance of vascular access in hemodialysis patients to related to their short-term and the long-term mortality. Because in our hospital, we routine measure our dialysis patients' vascular blood flow every three months. We have done it for more than 20 years. So we have very plenty of data to support this study. And we find uh, when the excess flow below 500, it is sharply related to the mortality when compared to other groups of blood flow. So that means when the excess flow is decreased, it closely related to the mortality in our patient. 
So as from the perspective of patient care, it is an important and a crucial issue. Uh, during the and in our Taiwan, we have uh, more almost eighty percent hemodialysis patient among the end stage renal disease groups. However, the eighty percent rate of AV fistula failure in Taiwan. If we uh, translate this percentage to real world data, in Taiwan we are more than eighty thousand. Uh, end stage renal disease patient uh, receiving uh, dialysis and uh, 80% for hemodialysis so we all approximately have 607,000 67,000 patients receiving hemodialysis that means we have uh, 107 event rate of every fistula failure to need the thrombosis therapy or to uh, receive the surgical intervention for stenosis. We know we have many uh, kind of choice for vascular access. In Taiwan, most of our patient choice AV fistula. It is according to the guideline, the most uh, durable and the most consistent use of fistula have better care quality than other Vascular. However, the importance is using this kind of treatment during hemodialysis session uh, need monitoring, surveillance, and a somewhat diagnosis test. The monitoring means physical examination to detect pathological physical sign. The surveillance uses the periodical evaluation by uh, means of test. That means uh, use the transonic machine or use the blood flow assessment. That kind of uh, can quantify this blood flow translate into the data. And the diagnosis mostly means the uh, image to assess the abnormality of the vascular. However, uh, it really requires experience. Here are some signs of vascular dysfunction when during the dialysis section, the clinical suspicion should uh, highlight to the vascular dysfunction. The first one is assess extremity edema. And the second one is post vein puncture, prolonged bleeding time. The third is the conversion of portable thrill to pulse. When the power through to the pulse, it means the blood flow may be below 500. Besides, by uh, listening, we can identify the boots. It means high pitch. High pitch means the occurrence of stenosis. During the dialysis section, uh, elevated negative arterial pre pump pressure also suggests the arterial inflow stenosis occurs in this. So what's the difficulty? If we have many experience and uh, many technique, uh, the dif difficulties, that means equal to the why we need surveillance. We have three reasons for doing this. The first one is experience. We know it experienced nurse or technician or physician have different idea of this vascular dysfunction. Besides the quantity of the experience measurement or physical examination, it cannot be quantified. The third, the third one is kind of physical examination cannot relate it to the patient's outcome. So we need more accurate machine more accurate maneuver to identify the real blood. Mostly we use the transonic uh, HDO3 to assess the blood flow. When uh, the blood flow of every fist below 500 or every graft below 600 and the assess flow reduction over 25% in the past four months, 
it may refer to the vascular surgeon to uh, create new shunt or to a uh, revision their AV fistula. But what is the next? It's our uh, major majority of this talk. It is a portable device to identify the uh, patency and the efficacy of vascular assess. Besides, it can uh, upload the data to the cloud to share with the physician and the nurse in the hemodialysis. That means PPG, photobletisomography sensor to measuring blood flow uh, at AV fistula. It's Professor Zhao's invention in National Jiao Da University. Uh, what is PPG? It is a, a kind of a technique to using the light to sense the flow in our tissue. So it is a non-invasive measuring method to uh, change the to use the fixed wavelength light in the living tissue. So it ha has a sensor to sense the change of the reflection by optical emitter and uh, they translate this kind of reflection into some kind of wave change. So using the measurement, they can identify the blood flow change by using this. It is the implantation. Using this sensor probe on AV fistula can sense the change of blood flow and can calculate the blood flow change and uh, doing to uh, measuring blood flow using the artificial new work neck model to self-learning the change of the calculation. So we use this kind of machine to conduct a study in Xinguang Hospital and uh, compare with the golden standard transonic HD03. Uh, patient not allowed to talk during the measurement. And uh, that is the real picture when we do this study, we open this machine and the charging and we key in several data to mesh before and detect using uh, our this sensor on patient's AV fistula and this at the real side to measurement and we can see it is a before measurement and the stable wave show up in the model. This year, there are some case report. The case one is 70 year old female, hemodialysis for four years. The diversity of the uh, HD03 because due to different weight of needle puncture. In this way, the HD is over 2000, but this way it is 1040. However, our PPG reveal the real data in uh, this so it can correct the data of HD inside due to their uh, pitfall of different weight of the needle puncture. The second one is a 65 year old male. They, he have a diverse uh, vessel. So during the section they can measure HD03. However, our PPG data is consistent. It is not uh, interfered by the diverse here is our unpublished data we using this HD Linsan HD03 and the PPG have a strong association here is some comparison of the traditional device to measure our patient's access flow uh, I think it is easily used and uh, wireless and uh, inexpensive besides patient can set detect in their home so our conclusion is new arterial neural network can accurate measurement of every fistula by ppg sensor and we think it can bring some light for our hemodialysis patient to improve their quality control care of their vascular assist.
Thank you for your attention. Well, Dr. Fan has introduced as a portable device, non-invasively can measure the blood flow of our AV axis with uh, the input of blood pressure data of the patient as well as the saturation of the patient, plus a device, just a tiny device portable to do the measurement. Then uh, it can probably it can replace or correlate to the uh, transonic measurement of the blood flow. Then we can do our surveillance and do the uh, uh, further treatment uh, for the patient. So I think we can have some discussion on this device uh, presented by Dr. Fun, uh, our panelist. How do you think about the device? Is it useful in your daily practice? Actually, uh, for surveillance, we have learned that in new guideline, the surveillance is not as important, even if we put it in the second line uh, compared to the monitor itself. But still, I think probably those kind of devices are quite helpful. Jackie? Um, yes, very nice to see this portable device that can uh, do the test maybe every time before the patient go for dialysis. Um, I, I have a very quick question. Uh, is this more on monitoring the actual volume or it's more on the trend of the uh, uh, results? Uh, and, and I think uh, later on, I also hope that uh, maybe Milin, uh, who is the uh, director of the uh, FMC, uh, uh, he, he is actually looking after a lot of patients uh, over there. And maybe he can also comment on that later on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. We want the, 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 the opinion from someone who take care of the dialysis every day. Uh, as far as I know, the device, a portable device, uh, uh, it, it can measure uh, every time the uh, blood flow of the axis, uh, and they had done uh, studies uh, correlated to transonic machine uh, numbers, and they found a quite high correlation with, um, with that. So any other commentators want to comment on this? Um, yeah, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Jackie. A um, uh, couple of points, uh, this would, of course, uh, be very, very helpful in the dialysis setup. And I have to look after a large volume of patients. And if we can have some device like this, that will be uh, quite helpful. It will be nice also to correlate it with clinical outcomes because, uh, you know, there has been a lot of controversy based on volume flow measurements for uh, correlating with outcomes. So if it can correlate with thrombosis uh, or even uh, need for interventions and time of, uh, uh, of course, the uh, time to intervention or most importantly uh, is the life of uh, AV fistula or AVG, that will be quite nice. But of course, that uh, research will take time. We also have a similar project in Singapore, uh, which I run with some of my colleagues and uh, we have used similar approach. So I think maybe it is also time for us to join hands together and uh, work on this. I was supposed to be in Taiwan and would have uh, uh, been very nice to meet Dr. Liu, but I'll reach out separately. Well, so Nikami, you, have, you have mentioned that you have similar project in Singapore. So uh, doing one step or how, how, how is the gadget? Is it built? Is it in clinical use or still in um, very infant I cannot. Age? I cannot say too much because of proprietary reasons of in course. public forum, but uh, it is similar, uh, but there are a few more sensors available. Uh, we have also focused on volume flow measurements, but also more on the trend part. Um, it is, uh, I would say it is 80% uh, built. Uh, so yeah. we still need a little bit more clinical data. So but I think either, instead of competing, we should collaborate. <laughs> So definitely, they, that kind of gadget, they measure the numbers, and they measure, hook up to the uh, internet and do some calculation, and they can help yeah. our clinical judgment. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that and plus, we should also not ignore that there's a lot of real-time uh, data that comes from dialysis uh, procedure, uh, which is three times a day. So it is a, it is a, I will talk about big data in a moment, but it's a time yeah. of big data, and Good. to ignore any data would be uh, not ideal in this day and age. So, you know, uh, uh, each dialysis session three times a week generates high volume of data that needs to be incorporated. So we should proceed to the next talk. Yeah, thank you.
For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Tan Chie Suai from Singapore, sharing about report on first clinical trial of using serolimus coated balloon for HDSS stenosis. Thank you for the invitation to share with you on the use of serolimus coated balloon in the salvage of thrombosed arterial venous graft. First, I would like to apologize for not being able to be in Taipei to share with you on this topic. As in Singapore, we are fighting the COVID-19 outbreak and I hope that the situation will get better over the next few months. A functioning access is critical to the delivery of life-saving hemodialysis therapy in patients with end-stage renal disease. Arterial venous grafts are created in patients who have poor veins or are poor candidates for arterial venous fistula creation. However, New intermal hyperplasia often occur at the graph vein junction, resulting in narrowing of the vessel, poor flow within the graph, and ultimately thrombosis. Although we are able to successfully salvage thrombosed arterial venous graph either through open or endovascular technique, the patency rate after successful salvage therapy remains poor. Based on the literature, the average 3 and 6 month patency rate post salvage are 49 and 38 percent respectively. This prompted the Society of Interventional Radiology to recommend a target patency rate of 44 percent at 3 months and 21 percent at 6 months. In our center, our patency rate was close to the recommended target patency rate. However, if we examine the figure closely, it still meant that up to half of the patients who had undergone successful salvage therapy would be back again within three months. In our center, we attempted to improve the outcome by applying paratexia coated balloon for patients who present within three months of their prior intervention. But as you can see here, the effect was not great and only 43.6% remained patent at three months. Therefore, besides looking at the technical success rate, we should also focus on improving the functional longevity of the AVG after successful salvage therapy. Serolimus coated balloon has been successfully used in coronary artery intervention by preventing intermal hyperplasia associated with balloon angioplasty. Compared to palletaxia, which is the current drug used in drug-coated balloon for peripheral intervention, serolimus is cytostatic in its mode of action. Moreover, it has a huge margin of safety compared to palletaxia. We therefore postulate that the application of serolimus coated balloon at the graphene junction after successful endovascular thrombectomy will minimize neurotermal hyperplasia and thereby improve the pregnancy of the AVG. In terms of sample size, we took into consideration the suggested 3-month primary pregnancy rate of 44% by the Society of Interventional Radiology. If we assume that serumous coated balloon will improve the 3-month pregnancy rate to 75%, a sample size of at least 19 is required to show the significant improvement from baselines. Hence, we carry out a single center prospective study of 20 patients who presented with thrombose AVG. Surolimus coated balloon is applied at the graphene junction after successful endovascular salvage, and the patients were follow up at 3 and 6 months with duplex ultrasonography. These were the primary and secondary endpoint. The primary endpoint was set as the primary patency rate of the AVG at 3 months, and the secondary endpoints were the patency rate at 6 months, and the number of interventions needed to maintain the patency during the study period. These were the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Essentially, we only look at thrombose AVG in the upper limb, and patients with central vein stenosis or standard graft vein junctions were excluded from the study. 
A total of 37 patients were screened and 20 patients were recruited over a one-year period. The last patient was recruited in September 2019 and just completed the six-month follow-up. Majority of the screening failure were due to the presence of coexisting central vein stenosis. Others were due to the presence of residual thrombus or had failed endovascular salvage of their thrombus AVG. These are the baseline demographic data of the 20 patients that were recruited. The median age was 68 with a predominant female population. Majority of the patients are diabetic, and up to 50% were on antiplatelet therapy prior to intervention. The median vintage of the ABG was 14.5 months and were predominantly in the upper arm. About a third of these patients had one to two intervention in the preceding 12 months. TPA was the thrombolytic agent used in two-thirds of the cases. 7mm high pressure balloon was the predominant balloon size used to treat the culprit lesion and cutting balloon had to be used in 20% of the patient. The size of the serolimus balloon used ranges from 7 to 8mm. Most significantly, none of the patient has any significant residual stenosis or thrombus after the procedure. These are our results. The primary patency rate at three months was 76.4%, with three patients experiencing rethrombosis within 90 days, and one had repeated angioplasty performed for low flow in the AVG. Three patients had complications before reaching the three month endpoint. The complications were all unrelated to the use of steolimus coated balloon. One had surgical revision of the A limb of the AVG for pseudo aneurysm formation eight days after successful thrombolysis. One patient passed away from intracranial hemorrhage, and one had explant of the AVG at eight, the eight days. Significantly, these three AVGs were all patent at the time of the event. The primary patency rate at six months was 64.7% as two patients had rethrombosis of their excess at 134 and 157 days post-intervention. This is how the Kaplan-Meier curve looks like. The estimated median primary patency is 381 days. The range is pretty big at 138 days. This is one of our first few patients who was recruited in the study in 2018. Post thrombolysis, the graft vein junction was treated with the serolimus coated balloon. This is how the graft vein junction looks like on DSA. And this, this is how the graft looks like. 13 months after treatment with serolimus. Significantly, the patient did not require any interventions within the 13 months interval. From our study, it will appear that treatment with serolimus coated balloon at the graphene junction after successful salvage of thrombose AVG appears to be safe and the primary patency rate at three and six months appear to be superior when compared to plain balloon angioplasty. The limitation of our study include the small number of patients recruited and the possibility of selection bias. Moreover, aggressive treatment with high pressure and cutting balloons were required to manage the acute recoil of the graphene junction, which may not be the situation in the real world where stenting of the graphene junction is often used to manage the acute recoil. Nevertheless, within the limit of our studies, we have demonstrated the feasibility of using serolimus coated balloon after successful endovascular salvage to improve the three and six month primary patency of the circuit. Larger randomized controlled studies are required to verify our findings. 
With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have learned that several limits below me in Grappling Junction uh, performance. So, Song Yu, how do you think about that study? I think this is interesting, but uh, I think um, I am more interested about uh, the cutting balloon. Could, could I identify the, the result of the cutting balloon? I can't see any result over that. Because I, I think because the, the if you force to uh, injury the vessel, then you can uh, uh, stimulate the information. If we give the some drug, will prohibit. And I some from the PAD uh, experience, I see some patient use the device. We use a cutting balloon. Uh, you, we use the drug cutting balloon. We see the pseudon injury and reasonable dilatation about the target. So I, I am interested about if you use the cutting balloon in this graft uh, junction, it's work or it will be an increased modulate. Especially this result may be have one year's result. So I want to ask the speak, have any experience about that? Yeah. Uh, for, for me, myself, I do have two questions in mind. Uh, first, we do have Pacritasso or uh, balloons on the market. So why do we need a serolimus? And secondly, uh, this uh, study is regarding the artificial graph outlet junction. So does it, uh, can we have a similar performance on regular AV fissure? So may we refer to our, our panelists uh, to have some comment on this talk? I yeah, so uh, there were two questions. Number one was on the use of a cutting balloon. We do have a subgroup of patients who require cutting balloon. The requirement for enrollment will be successful treatment of the graft vein junction of the, after thrombectomy. So we need to treat it such that the, there is no recoil. In the subgroup, 20% patient who actually do not, uh, who underwent cutting balloon, they have similar uh, performance as uh, as compared to the high pressure balloon group. So I do not think it's the cutting balloon that is uh, per se the reason for their longevity, but rather the, the ability to achieve uh, no residual stenosis as being the goal of, uh, of treatment. Now with regards to uh, palataxia versus serolimus, as we know palataxia itself is, uh, there's some controversy uh, employed in it, uh, especially in the lower limb. And secondly, we do know that majority of the drug is actually lost during transit for palataxia coated balloon. In comparison, serolimus uh, coated balloon, uh, the technology is such that it's uh, actually using a nanotechnology where the balloons are actually sprayed with serolimus uh, using a lipophilic uh, molecule. So the transmission of the drug is actually very efficient with uh, no loss of drugs. And uh, the safety margin uh, of serolimus is much higher than that of palataxia. And uh, secondly, as a nephrologist, we are very familiar with serolimus. I mean, it's one of the drugs that we use in transplant patients. So when they were approaching us to, to try this out, I said, why not give it a shot? And we are quite surprised with the results. Now, whether this is applicable to uh, arterial venous fistula, uh, we have done a pilot study about 20 patients. The results were very encouraging. We are looking at up to 90% patency rate at three months which uh, we have not shared in this presentation, but that is part of our registry work. So at this point in time, I would say that serolimus coated balloon appears to be effective, as uh, effective as palataxia coated balloon. However, we are still in the early stages and we are planning to uh, run some randomized controlled trial to verify our findings. Now, as to why we use the grabbing junction, why we use the choose the ABG, because the prototypic lesion is actually a new intermal hyperplasia. And therefore, if the serolimus coated balloon works by inhibiting uh, neutermal hyperplasia, we can actually show and demonstrate the uh, positive outcome. And when we this drug, this technology came about, we decided to do it in the worst group, which is the ABG, because there is nothing else better in the market. And therefore, we actually chose the thrombose ABG group to to, to, to do this pilot study rather than in the fistula group. Well, thank you. Uh, we may discuss on this with um, other two similar topics later on. And so we are moving to next talk. Next talk will be.
our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Milan Nikam from Singapore, talking about application of AI to dialysis and vascular access care. Good morning, everyone, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I was actually looking forward to it. Uh, I, um, but uh, and actually had my tickets booked and everything. But uh, the government of Taiwan has asked us not to come over because we cannot participate in public uh, forum. Are we able to see my slide share? Because I'm a little. Uh, yes. Well, uh, Milan, would you share your slide to all of our audience? instead of the camera share your oh, slide okay okay i'll keep talking in the meanwhile the zoom is not opening no share screen uh, let's see are you able to see it now okay. yes yes yeah okay so uh, yeah, I um, I am also an interventional nephrologist, but I look after uh, the dialysis services part of our business for physicians in uh, all of Asia, that includes Taiwan. That's one of the reason I also was looking forward to being there. And part of my role is to look after the and coordinate the AI or what we normally call as machine learning efforts for improving vascular and hemodialysis care. Most of my talk will be surrounded on hemodialysis, but I think it will give you a flavor of what things are, what are the possibilities. And I think if I can achieve that, that would be um, enough for this 10 minute session. So uh, let us get it started. I will give a very brief introduction of uh, AI and machine learning, a little bit about our organization so that uh, you are aware of what sort of uh, things we do and the volume of uh, work that is uh, that can contribute to these efforts. And uh, a very quick flavor of the uh, models that are in development. I There is no way we can go through all of them because that would take me two days just to go through them. So it'll be just a very, very brief overview. And uh, I always like to relate things back to what is our purpose. It is, I know um, using machine learning technologies is actually now very, very fancy, and uh, but it is also important that it relates back to our purpose. So start with our first section, which is a quick overview. So um, I'm not sure if you have uh, used the Google Trend search before. It is actually quite a nice way to find out uh, what is uh, fashionable these days and I often do when my children are searching things on Instagram, what are they looking for? But another way to do that is uh, if you look at the three search items, big data, AI and machine learning, you will see a big uh, rise in their uh, search since about five to seven years. Okay. So uh, th uh, this tells you something and I'll, I'll visit that in a slide or two of why that is important or interesting. If you are really interested in this field, uh, you can uh, be assured that you know all the big money is also going into AI and healthcare. So uh, it is a good field to be in and it's good to learn about this thing. So um, most importantly, let me uh, visit these three terms, which is uh, AI, machine learning and deep learning. Often they are used interchangeably and that's not terribly wrong thing to do, but uh, machine learning and deep learning are, are sort of uh, parts of or components of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, which is not a new thing. It has been around since the 1950s. And it is again important uh, to look at why it has now suddenly or in the last five to 10 years become so fashionable, but also why it has become so important. If you're talking to a geek, uh, I would suggest you use the word deep learning. Uh, if you're talking to somebody who is a little bit aware, use the word machine learning. In general, AI is also quite reasonable. So what has driven this change is uh, the ability to uh, crunch big data. Okay, and big data just doesn't mean volume. It also means variety. Previously, we were, uh, I'm sure all of you recall going through SPSS sheets where you spend more time manipulating the data rather than actually uh, uh, doing the analysis. And this is the uh, change in um, uh, structure because now you can also uh, crunch unstructured data such as, uh, you know, free text, uh, uh, dictations, etc. And most importantly, the computing power has become uh, such uh, uh, so uh, so um, um, so strong that we can uh, do this at a fair velocity and speed. So uh, there is no standard definition of these terminologies, but it is basically an ability of uh, machines to learn and evolve, just like humans do, and also the ability of machines to carry out smart tasks, which they were not able to do in the past. 
okay and machine learning as i mentioned earlier is just an application of ai another important point which we should look at is that human intervention is required so um, a lot of people worry that uh, machines are going to take over the world and all but uh, at every stage and in fact at most stages uh, human intervention is required i mentioned the three big ways which we will revisit again and then there are many applications uh, self driving cars i see that people uh, when humans don't do a job very well like driving cars uh, you know it's good to consider a self driving car similarly predictive models application in genomics study designs also even drug design and i'm sure you've heard a lot about this so i'll move to the next slide um very brief overview of what analytics has looked like uh, in the past and what it looks like now so at the bottom left hand corner are the descriptive and diagnostic analytics which tells you uh, which answers questions like how many and um, uh, morely uh, tell you why etc sometimes but the new era of the analytics also are able to uh, predict such as what is going to happen in the future and of course it can also help you uh, for perhaps in the future as what you can do about it okay so that doesn't ignore the left hand part uh, left hand bottom hand part of descriptive and diagnostic analytics they remain important and they will increasingly be incorporated into the future models it is also important to see how uh, that affects from hindsight insight and foresight so uh, the bottom two are your traditional analytics and uh, the um, newer analytics uh, are predictive and prescriptive analytics so i have mentioned before the three v's are the main enablers of ai but if you just look at this from a healthcare context you know we are all quite used to uh, using the clinical parts you know informations like medical encounters demographics drugs uh, what happens in the hospital the medical history comorbidities etc increasingly we will be using patient reported symptoms or patient reported outcomes etc and often uh, the trend is also now moving about physician data so for example how good a interventional nephrologist i am would be incorporated by the data automatically what is the quality of my facility what are, what is the quality of my people who are working in the facility but increasingly are more fascinatingly uh, genetics environmental information and of course what is more exciting is that you will start capturing data from uh, the patients when they are not on coming for dialysis three times a week what are they doing at home what they eat what is their purpose in life you know all kinds of things so what is interesting is this you don't have to wait for these models to be built in you have to don't have to wait for this to go into your excel sheet and then analyze this can be used in real time so uh, that is a complex part how does it what does it mean to a simple doctor like me is uh, uh, very simple i used to work in uh, general nephrology clinics i still do that uh, now and then and if you look at uh, what i i used to often think that you know if i can uh, somehow impart an algorithm into the doctor's brain ideally but that is not legal but in their uh, in the in their computers where there is already data from the patient and uh, use this algorithmic approach to manage simple ckd uh, you can you can definitely improve outcomes or at least assist them in healthcare so that the patients uh, actually get more human touch from doctors so if you put it very very simply this is what uh, uh, this technology is going to bring to us Uh, very quickly about our company we have over 3900 dialysis centers in the world and look after 50 million people so this is not an advertisement it is just to give you an idea of the volume of data that we generate uh, just in north america we generate 9 petabytes which is a term i recently learned petabytes of data which means if you stack up the world's uh, wall street journal to the moon it has to go around 9 times so it just gives you a, a, a flavor of how much data is been generated each and every year and this got, this has to be put to good use um i'll skip this slide in the interest of time but you need you need people to do this not just machine as i mentioned uh, and i would uh, really like to urge uh, healthcare people uh, healthcare physicians nurses to get involved in this uh, domain uh, because you are the ones who will be able to drive the business need as we call them but you also need data scientists engineers statisticians and mathematicians uh, working with you next one is uh, looking at what sort of models are available so uh, we can broadly and somewhat crudely classify them into predictive models prescriptive models and of course the risk stratification models um one example of a prescriptive model is anemia control module this has already been tried and lots of publications are there from the from my colleagues uh, in europe but it's also uh, soon will be tried in uh, in singapore 
uh, what this model does is it looks at the one year history of, of the patient purely from anemia perspective takes lots of variables into account such as the hemoglobin the iron indices the inflammatory status the their drug dosages and then it is able to give a recommendation of what dose of erythropoietin and or iron you should use now if you just put this model into the context of clinical care and the doctors use the model to uh, or accept or refute the de uh, description uh, suggestion just using the model brings down the cost of care while actually improving the outcome so i won't go into the details of this in the interest of time but it just gives you an idea of what these models are going to do, do for us um there is also a new model which has been uh, recently granted fda approval what this model does is it takes into account uh, uh, feedback by uh, real time biofeedback from uh, devices which do blood volume monitoring during a course of dialysis session and of course all the information from the patient's history and is able to suggest what ultra filtration rate uh, should be used as you many of you will know that uh, fluid overload is one of the most important cause of morbidity and mortality in dialysis patients so uh, controlling ultra filtration re uh, rate to suit the patient's needs is actually uh, very important um many of you know this but the models are not really very different from traditional mathematical approaches so i will skip this part uh, again in the interest of time because i did a little boo boo and thought that the uh, talk was for 20 minutes um these are the models currently in development uh, we also have not forgotten our pd patients uh, we are looking at survival peritonitis even membrane failure and ckd uh, patients were before the dialysis so ckd progression cardiovascular hospitalization for ckd patients uh, the ckd model is actually already developed and in use in uh, europe again uh, one of the model which is a big uh, uh, a big deal for us because hospitalization is one of the biggest problems that faces particularly hemodialysis patients and our colleagues in north america have looked at this model and they have, uh, this model predicts that the patient will or will not get hospitalized in the next 7 day period and this is the normal process of uh, of developing a model the deliverables are important and um, these are the variables that it takes into account you will see that it also takes into account nursing notes which are unstructured data uh, you know uh, different nurses write even the spellings etc are different so a lot of work has to go into building these models because the unstructured data needs to be needs to be sensed if you like um, we use a commonly used available uh, neural network called xg boost and the area under curve is uh, 0.8 so that is reasonably good and what this model has done is over and top uh, over and above the the efforts that our colleagues have done in north america to reduce hospitalization it brings down hospitalization by another uh, close to 9% which is which is quite significant when you take into account that this is applied to 30000 patients so um, one other thing which is available is a, a risk stratification model but you can also call it a, uh, a predictive model which um, uh, predicts the mortality of your patients in two years so it is imagine me looking at uh, taiwan and i will be able to give a uh, sit down with my colleagues in taiwan from my office in singapore and tell them what is the risk of the patients and dying in two years it doesn't stop there it will then go down to the level of each and every dialysis center and also inform them what are the variables in that dialysis center which are associated with this poor outcome so that we can work on these uh, things we can focus our resources there and in, in fact uh, even you utilize targeted education in the future not just to uh, not just to the uh, healthcare p, uh, uh, personnel but also to our patients uh, so you can imagine how this will improve access to healthcare as well but i'll come back to that point in a minute and just using this model uh, by having dialogues with our colleagues in each and every country uh, the hospitalization rates went down quite significantly if we apply this to our patients in uh, just in asia pacific that uh, actually equates to a lot of uh, saving not just for our patients but also for the healthcare economy we are also developing something in uh, fistula i can't go into details of all of these things but the fistula failure model is being developed in a very simple traffic light system which gives a green yellow and red signal and depending on the scoring it gives you a specific recommendation to the nurses what is uh, whether you should just uh, continue monitoring or should you get a, a physician to review this patient or should you refer them urgently for an intervention so this is very simplistic uh, method and while the area under curves are uh, not looking great yet the model is still being uh, trained uh, and 
we will bring this over to to asia pacific soon one of the other models we are working on which i haven't put in here is uh, very simple and this is being done in north america where the nurses take a photo of the patient's fistula and particularly uh, the aneurysms and based on uh, artificial neural networks the model is able to predict and actually give a recommendation which category uh, the the uh, aneurysm falls in and the nurses then can take action based on the categorization so for example it's uh, it's a very simple categorization 1 to 5 uh, 5 being something which requires urgent attention such as for example there is skin damage etc so you are all familiar with this so i won't go into details of that another model uh, very exciting one particularly for me uh, this model predicts uh, what is going to happen at each and every individual dialysis session of the patient before the patient walks into uh, not before they walk into but before the patient are actually connected to the dialysis uh, machine so they walk into the dialysis clinic uh, swipe their card and go and weigh themselves as soon as they weigh, weigh themselves the uh, model is able to predict what is going to happen at the end of the dialysis session what will be the blood pressure what will be the heart rate what will be their uh, solute clearance and most importantly what is also going to be the fluid removal that we can achieve and as you can see there is very little uh, uh, if any significant difference between what is observed and what is predicted what these models are able to achieve for us is if you look at traditional variables i cannot reliably predict just based on this variable at each and every session which patient is going to have a problem but this model reliably does that and what it allows us to do is uh, it can generate graphs like this it can bring the ultra filtration it allows us to bring the ultra filtration rate down so that we can extend the time of the session and the patient will not have uh, will not have this side effect and intradialytic hypotension is a significant uh, um, morbidity that we generate on dialysis and it is accruable so uh, what this is allowing us to do is actually move from uh, move from prediction to prescriptive assistance but also to prevention of uh, complications on dialysis so as i mentioned earlier i always i talk a lot about purpose uh, not just in life but also we should relate everything we do to the purpose uh, that we have which is to look after our patients and uh, dialysis is a very expensive therapy most of the cost is actually spent in hospitalization so newer ways or newer care models are being developed which is now called as value based care not just in dialysis been other areas of uh, healthcare and if you look at the uh, traditional uh, model of value based care data has become one of the most important part of uh, improving care uh, because this is the 21st century and we cannot just uh, keep on doing uh, improving care by uh, using traditional methods so uh, and one of the other particular challenges of uh, dialysis which i always like to bring out is lack of individualization we use the same kind of treatment for almost all of our patients four hours uh, three times a week or two times a week sometimes in uh, countries with uh, less resources whereas the rest of medicine is actually moving towards very very individualized therapy which i'm sure many of you have read about uh, to the level of patient so and we need to we need to give up on this one size fits model and look at how we can incorporate the individual patient into uh, into our care models and um, that is uh, that is what it means to me you know towards more personalized at the same time more precise medicine but also particularly for asia pacific it is these uh, these technologies will uh, allow us to look at an important component which is access to healthcare access to expert care and therefore uh we we all have to we all have to embrace uh, this uh, if you try to run away it's already there so we cannot really run away it's already having an impact on kidney care and dialysis i think it makes us more intelligent and efficient um thereby release some more time that we don't spend on ehr but actually look at uh, uh, our the human aspect of care and as i mentioned earlier it allows us to improve access to care so i get very commonly asked the question is that will be will i be out of a job soon um, i think i like my job so i don't hope so but uh, i don't think that will be the case either uh, i think it will allow us to uh, care for people in a more humane way and uh, lastly if you are very interested in this thing i would uh, a good starting point is this book by dr eric chopol which gives a application of ai in healthcare and with that i will uh, finish here and uh, welcome any questions if there is time and most importantly thank you for the organizers for having me here thank you 
Thank you, Milan, uh, for your inspiration. And I think the field is uh, pretty promising. I think we want to invite some short comment from our uh, panelist. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Nikon, uh, uh, many thanks for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. I'm uh, Remy Chen, uh, uh, a nephrologist uh, in Japan. And uh, in Japan, uh, I, I, I wanted to uh, share uh, some of my comment uh, because uh, you already answered my questions in your last uh, slide. <laughs> Uh, in Japan, more than uh, ha uh, we have uh, more than 4,000 HC centers in Japan, and uh, uh, more than half of the HC centers are treated by non-specialist physicians or surgeons. So uh, many medical treatment plans are just based on uh, only the uh, quality indicators according to the guidelines. So I've always uh, think about um, uh, this is. Uh, almost the same to the AI or an uh, automatic analysis seems. So um, uh, my question is, uh, um, do you think uh, uh, the, in the future, the regular HD will um, no longer to ne uh, need any physician to <laughs> uh, uh, operate it? Uh, but I think uh, the, your last slide already uh, asked uh, the questions. So, um, well, will, will the artificial intelligence replace the uh, physicians? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm afraid uh, if uh, we lost, uh, we, we will yeah. lose our work in the future. Mila, you uh, may I, I am afraid not. Uh, actually, I um, so my job is to actually coordinate care. Uh, in dialysis across Asia. So I have 22,000 or 33,000 patients if I include Japan. Um, there is no way I can reach out to all these people, okay? What will allow us to actually uh, focus on is what matters more, not just KT over V and not just hemoglobin. Because I always say in my value-based care talks that um, if you want to generate value out of care, you cannot just look at one thing, okay, or two things. Uh, because these solutions will have incremental impact. To actually make a big impact, you need to look at everything. Okay, and you can only deliver that when you focus on patient outcomes such as hospitalization, mortality, etc. So this will, what this will allow, for example, you have to look at 4,000 patients. This will allow us you to reach to those dialysis patients using uh, those non-experts. Yeah, because I have this particular problem in Indonesia. There are 120 oh, yeah. nephrologists in Indonesia for a population of 250 million people, which is kind of the similar number of nephrologists in Singapore. Yeah. where we have about 6 million people. So, uh, so you know, it gives you a scale of the problem. But there is no way we can just uh, reproduce nephrologists in Indonesia who are going to go to and provide oh, yeah. that. But what this will allow us to focus and uh, give some solutions and tools to these physicians who are providing care at the point of, uh, point of the patients. Very good. Yeah. So, I, I, I completely uh, agree I think you. We have an online, uh, we have online questions from our audience who is going to ask, I think, uh, about the drug balloon. Uh, may, may I invite Dr. Tan, um, Tan Chen Shui, to answer the question. As um, Chief Intervention Radiologist at SGH, um, you, may, you had a nephrologist, and you have a lot, of, a lot of experience in treating those lesions. And our online audience asks you, um, how about the efficacy of the drug balloon on lesions with thrombus? Does the drug go through the thrombus and can be effective? And the second uh, question is quite straightforward. For the, for the graph outlet uh, lesions, how to choose the proper size? Okay, so with regards to the first question, for the drug-coated balloon to be effective, you need to clear the circuit of thrombus. So if there is residual thrombus, there will be no good contact with the vessel wall. So the drug will not be able to transfer effectively from the balloon to the vessel wall. Therefore, first requirement is that you need to complete the procedure as how you do it 
in a routine care. That means to remove to the thrombus to treat the underlying stenosis. What the drug coated balloon does then is to actually slow down the process of new intermal hyperplasia and therefore improve the patency of your procedure. The challenge in a lot of our thrombectomy procedure is that you get good technical success rate, 90 over percent success rate, but this patient will be back again. And a lot of time when they come back, it's because the angioplasty itself induces injury to the vessel wall. And as a result of this injury, the neoderm hyperplasia is uh, started and therefore it will recur again. And therefore, by adding in the drug coated balloon, at the culprit lesion, we can potentially slow down the entire process. And you can see that in one of the patients, in fact, quite a number of patients, they have intervention-free uh, days after the index procedure, which is very encouraging. The, sorry, what was the second question again? Size, how does, size choosing. Okay, so in, 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 our, in our site, we usually use the 6 mm millimeter, six millimeter graph. Therefore, the minimum size that we need to actually use would be the 6 millimeter. But if you, at the graphing junction, because of the size graph, the vein, the, the native vessel graph discrepancy, we generally oversize by either 1 or 2 mm. And therefore, minimum will be at least a 7 mm or the 8 mm to ensure good uh, contact with the native vessel. Because the you know, hyperplasia tend to occur right at the junction. If your balloon is too small, you only treat the graft side without coating the vessel side. And if it, the good thing about this drug coated balloon is that it's semi-compliant. So it actually moves to the shape of the graft vein junction. Unlike a compliant balloon, which may rupture the uh, graft component, the drug coated balloon are generally semi-compliant. And therefore, if you even if you over-inflate, it will mold to the shape of the vessel junction. So at the graph side, it will look smaller than the native vein side. So those are the features of the uh, drug coated balloon that uh, allow us to do that. But uh, I will usually use a 7 mm to ensure good contact at the graph side. Native vein side, if there's size discrepancy, I can go up to 8 mm to ensure good vessel contact. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I think it's time to proceed to next talk. Next uh, talks about drug balloon as well. For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Xing Junxian from Taiwan, who is on site with us in Taoyuan, talking about drug coding technology in chronic hemodialysis catheters and its applications. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Xing from Changke Memorial Hospital. Uh, today, I would like to discuss about the drug coding technology in chronic hemodialysis catheter and uh, its applications. First, I have no conflict of interest. Um, as vascular surgeons, we have the catheter last in our brief. However, a uh, catheter is lasting in the daily practice. About 80% uh, of the patient initiate their hemodialysis via any catheter, and uh, around 10% of the, these patients going on using catheters above, uh, above uh, three months after the initiation. Uh, catheters are still uh, have done their roles as vascular assets in some clinical situation. The guideline indicate is permanent usage for patients with a severe access induced uh, ischemia, or a patient with a severe heart failure and a limited life expectancy. And the guideline also indicate their short term usage with a patient with a PD peritonitis or patients who are waiting for the living donor transplant or the bridging uh, access during the access maturation or uh, during the complication. Uh, and uh, uh, last, the recent myocardial infection within two months, there is contraindicated for access creation. So I have to say, catheter designs and performance matters. Among these catheters, we prefer the parent-drone catheters the foreign, uh, with the foreign reason. The first is the symmetric tau tip designs. They had a, a low recirculation rate if reverse connected. Um, to our analogy, the reverse connection is not uncommon in the HD unit. And uh, the second is that it requires the shortest length within the right entrance, about 2.5 centimeters, uh, compared to other catheter designs 
that require four uh, to four point three centimeter within the right action. The last is the soap capacitive material is comfortable for patients uh, to bear bear at. However, there are still something we don't uh, will not satisfy about. It, one is the also the capacitive material itself. It is too soft for us to push for the pushability during the orbit wire exchange. The second is the large uh, side hole that will wash out the large solutions that cause the cassia thrombosis as shown in the bottom picture. So um, in the real world study about the cassia patency, the patent cassia is failed to show uh, the superior impedance compared to other cassia design. So the manufacturer had provided a new generation heparin coating uh, patent zone catheter. It contained a non thrombogenic heparin coating layer and a non thrombogenic negative charge hydrophilic coating layer. Uh, the manufacturer called fully the inner lumen uh, where the blood goes through and uh, the outer lumen from the uh, catheter cuff to the tip which were insert in the body. And uh, the only significant difference tell from the regular one and the capillary coating is the only the edge on the blue tip. The manufacturer also conducted the uh, in vitro and the in vivo study compare the coating uh, caster with the uncoating caster. They uh, have the conclusion that the coating, uh, heparin coating uh, Capacitors have decreased thrombosis and the fibrin sheath formation rate. There is the uh, single arm study that performed by the team of Michael Tao. They had uh, 60 casters within uh, 57 patients with a total catheter day about uh, 50, 5300. And the average injury time of caster is around 100 days. Uh, the result is quite satisfying the only six uh, catheters were exchanged due to the male function. There are six catheters uh, has to be, be removed due to the infection episode. There are just only three uh, bacteremic events uh, with total count about the point uh, 56 per thousand caster days. There are no uh, patients suffer from the heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So they have the conclusion in this study the heparin coating palindrome catheter is the safe and reliable way for the chronic dialysis usage. So I would like to share our case clinical case share at our hospital. Uh, this is the case one is about a 70 year old lady. Uh, she had a multiple access creation and maintenance. Eventually she had a catheter dependent for months. You can see a lot of uh, the at the stand over her upper body, and she is relied on uh, this static catheter for hemodialysis for months, and she is uh, brought to our clinics due to the catheter obstruction. So we had uh, the over the wire exchange simply via the original insertion site. The, with the VNR check devices that are provided by the manufacturer. As you can see, the two stylae they can put into the the lumen of the catheter to have a great support. We just put it uh, together and uh, make it very smooth while it's changing. However, the result is not satisfied. We have to uh, patient experience uh, muscle sepsis due to the catheter infection. So we have to remove the catheter uh, one month after the implantation. The second case is the 80 years old uh, female. Uh, she had been uh, Catheter dependent for years, and, uh, and you can see the multiple scar on her uh, on her upper body, and uh, she experienced several times of catheter revision. The last event uh, is the, uh, the the bacteremia episode, so we remove the catheter and set the temporary catheters via the uh, lower body. And before the operation, we perform the ultrasonography, and I can see a, a setable. Uh, diameter over the right internal jugular vein. Uh, but we are cautious because uh, she is the uh, catheter dependent for years. The possibility of a central venous occlusive disease is very high. So we set up angiography sheets 
and perform the angiography before we set uh, the, the, the implantation of the catheter. And uh, we found the very uh, weird angulated wire codes uh, during we manipulation with the wire. So we do the angiography, and it shows the total occlusion with much collaterals of the superior vena cava. And uh, finally, we uh, engage to the, with the wire into the right entrance. However, we face a very high resistance uh, over the peer when we pull, uh, pull, pull in the peer away sheets within her body. Uh, the patient is uh, agitative at the current status because she had uh, dementia and uh, we perform it under the local anesthesia. So the pa for the patient safety, we uh, shift to our uh, case implantation of the femoral uh, common femoral band. The tip is located over uh, at the IVC. But surprisingly, the catheter survives about half a year. And uh, the, the catheter has its post cuff with catheter uh, dislodged due to the patient's cell pull up. And so we had changed to the regular catheters. And uh, however, the patient is very, uh, had a multiple catheter failures episode that need a change per one to two weeks. So the nephrologist carrying primary care that should uh, patient uh, to the peritoneal dialysis. So in conclusion about our clinical experience about uh, this drug coating technology, the heparin coating uh, palindrome is that it had a dedicated uh, catheter design and a very good surface coating to have the outstanding and reliable performance according to our clinical experience and uh, the manufacturer also provide a very good banal trade device to give uh, better support during the overwire exchange. Uh, but the Achilles heel of this caster, it persists, is the infection. So for a uh, randomized control study to prove its clinical usage as the long-term uh, chronic access, dialysis access is still warranted. I'm Dr. Shin from Changge Memorial Hospital. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sim, for your uh, talks on the drug coding technology. It seems that drug coding technology is everywhere in vessel intervention device. We're going to have further discussion after the next talk from Singapore. For our next speaker, we're going to go into welcome Dr. Tae Kyang Hyung from Singapore, sharing about effectiveness of combination cutting balloon and drug coated balloon angioplasty of AVF patency. Good morning, everyone. Apologies uh, for not being able to be personally present in Taipei to deliver this talk. I would like to uh, congratulate the organizers for going forward with this meeting and uh, using technology to enable the conference to go on. This morning, I would like to talk on using a combination of cutting balloon and drug coated balloon for angioplasty of uh, dialysis AVF stenosis. These are my disclosures. Of note is that the two trials that I'm going to talk about, the institution and conjato trials, uh, were both partially funded by Boston Scientific. All of you are probably familiar with the K-Doki guidelines. Up to today, POBA is still the gold standard for the treatment of uh, AVF stenosis. As you can see in these pictures, the results are often good, but the six month permit patency is often uh, less than 50%. Fortunately, with repeated intervention, we are able to maintain the patency and function of this fistula and 12 month secondary patency in excess of 80% is quite easily achievable. The main pathologic basis for development of stenosis is the neointhermal hyperplasia. Numerous strategies have been described to address this uh, entity. And uh, here is one such example in an animal study where drug eluting stand and the bare metal stands were compared with uh, the drug eluting stand successfully inhibiting the neointhermal response. Of course, in recent years, a drug-coated balloon angioplasty is the new favorite 
method and uh, numerous randomized trials have already proven its uh, efficacy uh, when compared to POBA. Way back in 2014, we have done a randomized, sorry, randomized clinical trial comparing cutting versus high pressure balloon for the treatment of uh, resistant AVF stenosis. In this trial, we found that the six month primary patency of cutting balloon is uh, superior to high pressure balloon and the difference uh, is uh, statistically significant and the effect size is about 25%. Four years later, our group uh, conducted another randomized trial, this time comparing POBA with a uh, drug eluting balloon. Uh, and uh, again, we show that the drug eluting balloon is superior to POBA at both the six month and 12 month time point. And uh, they were uh, statistically significant differences. The effect size is about uh, 20%. So DCB is 20% superior to BOBA. So we hypothesized that if we combine cutting balloon and drug coated balloon, we may be able to get better patency. And the reason being with a cutting balloon, we could reduce elastic recoil by disrupting the fibrotic stenosis. And as we know, uh, recoil uh, is uh, a determinant of patency. Also in cutting balloon, the disruption of the stenosis uh, is controlled. Uh, hence, it should incite less uh, intimal response. And uh, further, the cuts made by the blades of the cutting balloon potentially could improve drug delivery to the various layers of the vessel wall. So we went on to conduct two trials, uh, the institution trial and the conchato trial. So the, the acronym is generated uh, using a software uh, and this is uh, what it stands for. Essentially, the difference between the two trials is that for institutional trial, we are looking at the recurrent stenosis, whereas in the conchato trial, we are looking at uh, stenosis that were resistant to conventional angioplasty. We will show you the details uh, in the later slides. So in institution trial, as I mentioned, we use a combination of cutting balloon and uh, drug eluting balloon for uh, recurrent uh, stenosis and recurrent is defined as within one year of the uh, last intervention. This is a prospective single arm observation of study. And I'll be presenting the interim analysis. We have uh, already completed patient recruitment, a uh, total of 44 patients, and uh, 28 patients have already completed 12 month follow up. And I'll be showing the data of these 28 patients. The primary and secondary outcomes are the standard uh, ones that we see with uh, fistula intervention. In the interest of time, I will be focusing only on uh, primary. Uh, patency of the target lesion. Of note, uh, the patency assessment is based on clinical follow-up and not on uh, imaging. Uh, the fistula is about four years old on average. The radiocephalic AVF forms the majority of the fistula and most patients had uh, interventions about six months uh, before the index uh, uh, angioplasty. Target lesion length is about 5 cm. Uh, most of the lesion, as expected, is in the juxta anastomotic segment. The pre treatment stenosis is severe, more than 70%. And most uh, cases have a single lesion, but we do have some cases with more than one lesion. And in these uh, cases, the most severe lesion will be chosen as the target uh, lesion. Uh, the cutting balloons used are uh, from 5 to 7 mm and the rock eluting balloons usually are oversized by 1 mm more. Uh, most have good uh, results with less than 30% residual stenosis, but we do have 8 patients uh, with more than 30% residual uh, due to elastic recoil. 
Um, the target lesion patency is about 85% at 6 months and 66% at 12 months. This is one example, a uh, very typical juxta and asthmotic stenosis, treated with cutting balloon first, followed by the drug of the balloon, and this is the result. This patient uh, has not come back for repeat intervention, and it's uh, already more than 12 months. This is uh, another patient where the result is not as good. As you can see, the lesion is uh, very long. Uh, although the post uh, cutting balloon and post drug coated balloon angioplasty looks good, uh, the patient returned about seven months later due to decreased flow rates. And the repeat uh, intervention angiogram shows uh, re stenosis uh, of the treated. Uh, segment. Next, uh, we talk about the Conjato trial. As mentioned earlier, this trial is similar to the institution trial, but uh, it involves uh, resistant ABF stenosis. Again, it's a single arm observational study. The sample size calculation uh, was based on a 20% effect size, uh, giving us 19 patients. So all these patients first underwent angioplasty with POBA uh, up to 15 atmosphere inflation pressure and they will only go on to the combination cutting balloon and a drug eluting balloon angioplasty if there is more than 30% uh, residual uh, stenosis. Similar uh, set of outcomes as its institution trial except that the cutoff time point is six months, and again, patency assessment is based on clinical follow-up. Very similar to institution trial, about four years old, uh, EVFH, predominantly uh, radiocephalic fistula. Almost 80% have prior angioplasty. Lesion length is a bit shorter for this trial. Uh, the lesions are a bit more evenly distributed. Uh, and we have a bit more patients with uh, more than one lesion. And again, only the most severe lesion is uh, chosen for the trial. This is one example from the trial of severe stenosis of a BBT, AVF. After POVA, significant recoil and went on to have cutting balloon followed by drug coated balloon uh, with good results. So, uh, for this trial, uh, the residual stenosis is again quite good and technical success uh, was 18 out of 19. Uh, one patient had greater than 30% residual stenosis and at the end of six months, none of the patients uh, lost uh, so-called target lesion patency. Only one uh, patient returned for repeat intervention and it was due to a non-target lesion stenosis. So in essence, the six-month primary target patency was 100% uh, for this trial. So if we compare these two trials with our two earlier trials, uh, we could see that uh, it seems to show that uh, by combining cutting balloon and drug-coated balloon, we have better results than cutting balloon alone or drug coated balloon alone. Obviously, strictly speaking, we can't really compare the trials like that. Uh, but suffice to say that it is not worse than, than either. So to really be very sure, we need head-to-head -head trials by comparing cutting balloon or drug coated balloon with the combination uh, treatment. So in conclusion, our preliminary observations suggest that the combination of cutting balloon and drug coated balloon is safe. We did not see any complication in both our trials. It is at least as effective as a cutting balloon or drug coated balloon angioplasty alone. Uh, but our data seems to suggest it's better and we feel that further studies are warranted, in particular randomized control trials, to confirm its efficacy and value in the treatment of AVF stenosis. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Well, congratulations and thank you, uh, Professor Tay, about the very impressive uh, study on DCP plus 
uh, cutting balloon. I'm sure our online panelists will have some uh, comment on this. Please raise your hand if you have any opinion on that. Please. Can I ask something very quickly? Uh, the cost factor uh, is uh, of a little concern here, isn't it? If you're using a cutting balloon and, uh, and uh, drug coating balloon, of course. Would that, uh, has uh, that been taken into consideration? Yeah, uh, so panelists who want to echo on this, the cost effectiveness, or uh, Professor Tay? Yeah, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, uh, cost is definitely a concern. I think similarly, the, when drug-coated balloon first came out for fistula intervention, uh, cost, uh, is a concern. Uh, in fact, uh, the randomized uh, trial that we published, uh, the POVA versus Brancoated Balloon, although it was a positive trial, uh, the patency advantage of Brancoated Balloon over POVA was around two months, uh, meaning it prolonged patency by about two months. We just uh, recently completed a cost effectiveness analysis based on that same data set of a randomized trial. And uh, actually, the, for the first two years, it, it wasn't cost effective. But uh, it, there is a trend favoring uh, that it, it might be cost effective. And uh, the reason it was cost effective is that for the drug coated balloon group, for some reason, the fistula ab uh, ab abandonment was lower than the POVA group. And uh, once uh, fistula is abandoned, I think the costs go up uh, significantly. So the, the short answer is actually uh, the, the, the cost benefit analysis, even if it's positive, is actually quite uh, marginal based on our last uh, randomized trial. So uh, for this, which is why we, we think that to, to get more cost effectiveness of more value, we need to prolong the patency uh, further. And one of the reasons we think that we could prolong that patency is to address the, the recoil uh, issue. And the cutting balloon, uh, unfortunately, uh, it does help in some of the cases, but not all the cases. As you can see in the institution trial, we have uh, almost 10%, uh, despite cutting balloon, there is still a significant uh, residual stenosis. But those that we could overcome the recoil, uh, it seems to lead to better patency. I guess this is similar in concept to the lower limb intervention where now, you know, vessel preparation is considered one of the key steps in before we apply the drug coated balloon. And if the vessel is prepared well, uh, the patency uh, would improve. Um, but at what point uh, the patency will translate to uh, cost effectiveness, uh, I think we, we still don't know. Unfortunately, for this dialysis patient, they are recurrent procedures. Even in the best, it, it, we are not able to prolong the patency in, indefinitely. So as long as they need to keep coming back, uh, it, it is challenging to, to prove uh, cost effectiveness, I think. Yep, thank you. And other comments from our online panelists? Jackie? Professor Tay, uh, thank you very, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, the two very nice design studies, uh, and it's a encouraging uh, preliminary result. Uh, I would like to ask your opinion in your experience of using the cutting balloon. Uh, how do you size the cutting balloon? Uh, and also, because I think there is always uh, people concerned whether one should downsize the cutting balloon a little bit uh, because of the uh, uh, 19 uh, microtome outside. Uh, and also secondly, in my experience, uh, to fully uh, efface the stenosis, a lot of the time we have to go beyond the rated pressure uh, putting on the balloon. And I, I would like to know your experience of 
usage of the cutting balloon. Do you, if you cannot get the lesion very nicely open uh, at the rated pressure, would you go further up or uh, what would be your strategy? Yeah, so for the cutting balloon sizing, usually, uh, typically the patient would have a, a pole bar first, right? Uh, so from the pole bar, I would use it as a guide whether to use the cutting balloon the same size as the pole bar or maybe slightly bigger uh, than the pole bar. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is if the cutting balloon does not efface at uh, first pressure, I would not uh, go beyond as the first option. What I'll do is I'll deflate and I'll rotate the cutting balloon so that the blades are now pointing uh, in another part of the stenosis. And then I will inflate it again up to the burst pressure. If that doesn't work, I will deflate again. I would again rotate the, the plates. Uh, oftentimes, by doing so, there is no need to go beyond the, the burst pressure. Uh, and quite often, sometimes by just keeping the balloon up for a, a little bit longer, it, it will uh, cut. I have not really encountered a lesion uh, that we, we can't cut. Sometimes uh, the, the, after the cutting balloon, even if it fully effaced, on the angiogram, we could still see a, a residual stenosis. And quite commonly, we still put in the, a, a balloon, the poba balloon, to, to may, may need to oversize. If I need to oversize, I'll oversize on the poba side rather than using a cutting balloon to touch up the lesion. Yeah, but of course, there will be some that will recoil, not so much because the cutting balloon couldn't efface, but even with that happening, it, it still recoil. Yeah. Thank you. Very promising result. Um, so during the session, we have discussed on uh, mobile detection, uh, mobile flow detector, and uh, we went through also the artificial intelligence technology in hemodialysis and also drug coding technology plus cutting balloon usage in dialysis access. So I wonder if there is any last minute comment from our online commentators. Uh, so if not, I'm going to close the session and I thank for all our online panelists and audience. Thank you.